Good morning, this is Angela with Park Rose Permaculture coming to you from my messy early spring permaculture garden. You can hear the song sparrows, maids, 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 put on your tea kettle little. The Anna's hummingbirds, the, well, my chickens. Um, you can also hear the woodpeckers all busting out their beautiful spring songs in an attempt to stake out territory and attract mates. So since it's spring and we're seeing an increase in wildlife activity, I figured it was a good time to bring up a certain terrestrial mammal that I really like but is much maligned and underappreciated and um, misunderstood in the garden. And that is the mole. There's actually several species of moles in North America, including the star-nosed mole. They are really starting to get active about this time of year, mid-March, because their breeding season is late February, depending on where you live, to mid-March is the beginning through late April. So moles live obviously underground and they, in the winter, move their burrows and tunnels deep below the frost layer. But in the spring, things start to warm up and these solitary mammals start to look for a mate. And so they begin to tunnel closer to the surface. That's when the gardener tends to notice them and tends to be frustrated with them. So I thought that I would talk about why I love moles and why I think you should keep them in your garden. Now, let me preface by saying I'm really into permaculture. Permaculture is a design system which uses 12 principles to help us design effective gardens and communities. Permaculture principle number seven is design from patterns to details. And I think that is a really applicable one when we are talking about how we look at moles. Moles are an insectivorous, solitary mammal that exists on every continent, I think, except Antarctica. So I think it's really important to look at them through the lens of permaculture principle number seven. When we say design from patterns to details, what we're saying is don't miss the forest for the trees, basically. Don't get such a hyper narrow focus that you are forgetting the big picture of your garden. Don't get so involved in one single element or one little thing that's going wrong that you can't see the whole value in it or you can't contextualize it within your garden. And I think gardeners can get this way when they look at molehills. Because all they see is, well, let me show you. So I actually sat right here because, as you can see, in the middle of where I am rooting my wisteria, a mole has pushed up a hill. Now, that's kind of an annoyance. It's not necessarily the most attractive thing ever. And it is really common this time of year. And I think that a lot of gardeners um, can get really fixated on the concept of the molehill being a bother in the garden and forget to step back. They just wanna focus in on this mound of dirt in the middle of their lawn or their garden bed and they forget to step back and look at what is the role of the mole in the context of my landscape. So I think it's really easy to, to say if you have a highly manicured lawn, if you have a highly ordered garden, a molehill does not fit your aesthetic and it can be a bother. It's easy for me, I have a big messy garden, but um, try and find some pictures from last summer and, and stick them in here real quick. I still get molehills in places where I don't want them, particularly a path right after I've put down wood chips. But even with that, I still think moles have a place in the garden and we shouldn't ignore them and we shouldn't try to remove them. So let me talk really quickly about what moles are and then we can talk more about how we want to use that designing from patterns to details principle. Um, also the permaculture principle of use and value diversity applies here as well because we can um, value the wildlife in our garden, not just the pretty songbirds, not just the bees. We can value the diversity of wildlife that is already here and harness it to make our garden better. 
without any input or work on our part, by the way. That's one of the reasons that I love moles. Like I just said, I'm a lazy gardener. I wanna conserve my energy. I want to obtain a yield in my garden, be it uh, a harvest of a crop or labor saved or a problem dealt with. And um, moles are really good at doing that for me. I'm gonna be really distracted because there's a bunch of songbirds flying in, sorry. So moles are not rodents. I see comments quite a lot calling moles rodents and they're not. Moles and voles are two different things. Moles are in the family Talpidae. They're sometimes called talpids and that's a group that includes shrews and includes the star-nosed mole and other mole species here in the United States. Like I said earlier, moles are solitary creatures. They only come together to mate and that's it. So when you see these increase in mounds in the spring, and not just mounds, but you can see areas where the sod or your path is kind of bumped up and there's a raised ridge of a tunnel close to the surface. Those are moles feeding, but also looking for a mate. And the mating season starts in late February to mid-March, depending on where you live. And that means now is the time when you're seeing an increase in mole activity. So, what am I seeing when I step back and I'm looking at the greater pattern and I'm not getting lost in the detail of that annoying brown lump in the middle of my path? So I've said it many times on this channel, I have dense clay soil. I know a lot of you have it as well, particularly because where I live, the top soil is depleted in most folks' gardens. I know when I've gone and worked for clients, I'm just I shouldn't be shocked and surprised, but what I find is very similar to what my garden was like 12 years ago, which is no topsoil at all. Just the subsoil underneath, just the clay underneath. And that clay is poorly draining. I can spend a lot of work double digging using the French method. I can broad fork it. I could rototill it, although I'm not a fan of tilling because it creates a, a dense compacted layer about 18 inches down. So it doesn't actually help you in the long run. I can spend a lot of hours and like work my deltoids pretty hard in the garden to try and bust up my clay soil. Or as I have talked about in previous videos, I can let nature do it for me. And moles are one of the things that does that very, very well with, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to, you know, like comfrey or rhubarb or something. I have to plant the plant and take care of it. Moles are here already and they're happy to go about digging their tunnels and creating those open channels. So when moles dig a tunnel, they basically are waiting for worms and grubs to try and traverse across the tunnel and they fall into the space and moles have excellent hearing and excellent sense of, of um, tactile sensation and they can sense the worm falling into their tunnel and they go and collect Moles it. are uniquely adapted to the tunnel systems they create, having poor vision, incredibly strong front paws for digging, and the ability to function well in a low oxygen environment. Moles also create caches or kitchens in their tunnel systems to store the grubs and earthworms and centipedes they collect for food. So they make this intense system of tunnels and as I said before, kitchens and um, nurseries and bedrooms. And all of those create airspace in the soil, that all of those create drainage. They're also utilized by a lot of other creatures in the soil as well. So they make habitat for um, other wildlife. So I don't have to go and do anything and the moles for the, the cost to me of occasionally having a mound here and there, occasionally having a m excited mole build a mound and uproot a tomato and I have to come back the next day and stomp my tomato back in the ground or occasionally making um, hills in my paths. That to me is a really small price to pay to save the amount of labor of having to do what the moles do naturally to loosen the soil and to create drainage. There have been a lot of posts in Pacific Northwest gardening groups in the last couple weeks where folks are frustrated and feel like moles are eating their uh, plants. Moles are obligate insectivores. They do not eat your plants. That is a myth. They will uproot them in their quest to get grubs around the base of your plants, particularly if you have cutworms you may find things uprooted and that's where the moles are doing you the favor of removing pests from your garden. Now, 
if you think that a mole is eating your tulips, it's not. Tulips are really tasty. Squirrels like to eat them, rats, voles, mice, um, n not moles. If you are concerned and feel like you need to kill your moles because you think that they are eating plants out of your garden, you might spend some time observing, permaculture principle, observe and interact, and check out who's really feasting on your plants because it's not moles. Cutworms are annoying to get rid of and quite a lot of work to try and get rid of. I don't want to use insecticide, obviously. Why not just let the mole be happy and do it for me? Again, no energy output on my part and I get a yield of reduced pest pressure and increased aeration of my soil. So when I step back and I look at the mole in the context of my whole garden and I look at what it does for my whole garden and its place in this ecosystem, I want to keep it. I want to keep it around and let it continue to do its job. There are ways to get rid of moles if you want to that are that are more humane or to discourage them. I've seen folks say plant mint. I will have my big rant all day long about how mint is not actually a great deterrent. Um, I grow mint all over my garden and it does not deter any kind of critter that I have seen ever. Um, concentrated mint essential oil may be another thing, but mint plants, no. You can put blood meal or cat litter or dog crap down your molehills as a deterrent. But I have found moles are pretty territorial. They can live in one area and use the same system of tunnels. They create new hills as they clear out collapsed dirt or make new rooms, things like that. But they can use the same system of tunnels for many years. So it's really hard to deter your moles. You can try, but I think it's easier if you just make peace with them. They are natural and intrinsic part of the local ecosystem where you live. Look at them in the context of what good they can do for your garden and try and enjoy their presence and realize that much like I have to deal with my dogs barking in order to put up with having dogs in my life or I have to deal with sometimes my chickens have pests and diseases that I have to treat but it's worth it to put up with and get a yield from and get benefits from having poultry. The same thing with moles, minor inconvenience of a mole hill and occasionally having to replant a plant that they uproot, totally worth it for the benefit they bring to the garden. So I hope you consider keeping your moles in your yard, value them, know that they're only about this big and they consume up to their entire body weight in insects a day. So they can do a lot of good in your garden, let them hang out, let them do their own thing and live their life and continue to focus on how you can design from patterns to details in your garden. Step back and look at the big picture and see how an element that's already here can be contextualized and can have value for you as a gardener. So enjoy your spring. Keep those moles. I'll be back soon.